I'm not sure if uh, this show still goes on. It's called the Mythbusters. Have you guys seen the Mythbusters? It comes on. It used to come on Discovery TV. Uh, it was one of my favorite shows in television. And I actually had the chance to meet those guys when I was working at IBM. They came to do a live show for us. You know, they're, they're known for blowing things apart and testing all ridiculous theories that people have. And one of my favorite episodes of Mythbusters is the one where they test a lot of these Hollywood things that we have seen, where you actually see most heroes, uh, whether it's the movie Ma Ma Matrix or any other films, dodge a bullet. So they wanted to test, is it really possible in real life to dodge an actual bullet? You know, if someone's shooting you, can you just dodge it? So they came up with this experiment where they set up a 200 yard distance and they had a guy shooting a you know paintball bullet not a real one and they had the other guy see so as soon as he sees the flash from the gun he would try to dodge it and they do this in um, slow motion so you can actually see it's fantastic it's on YouTube you guys should check it out now they do two three times and he does it multi he tries to dodge it multiple times but you guys guessed it he invariably gets hit and they actually measure, you know, there's a science behind it. They measure that the fastest human response time to dodge anything is 490 milliseconds. You know, if your instincts are super fast, you, it takes 490 milliseconds to dodge. And, and the speed at which the bullet travels is actually 230 milliseconds. So in a way, it's kind of a no-win deal, but it's actually fun to see the test come alive before you. You know, this is so much drama, this firing. So it, it kind of takes the myth that however cool your favorite hero is, he can't dodge bullets. <laughs> and that was the end result of the test. But you know, that's what tests do. You know, tests are there to tell us what we believe about something, is it true or not? You know, most of us are not going to act in Hollywood movies. I, I don't think so, if you guys have any other ideas, like those who are younger. And, you know, it's not wrong to do that. But we all go through life. You know, life throws its dart on us. And we are constantly trying to dodge one after the other. We know we can dodge it. We know we will get hit. But then, what hope do we have? to go through this. You know, today we are going to look at a passage as we're doing this series on how Jesus is greater than everything and looking at real life heroes. You know, these are the myth busters for us in the, in the book of uh, Hebrews, the hall of faith, where it's talking about Abraham, whom we saw last week, how God called him. And today is this passage, which is one of the most spectacular narratives in the entire Bible. You know, people say this is, the, this is the, the narrative style of this beats any Hollywood movies. I don't know why I'm using a lot of Hollywood today. It's just coming off. But what we see behind is today is kind of one of the pinnacle. You know, we all know Abraham as a man of faith. And today his faith was tested like nothing else. And, and we read in Genesis chapter 22 the entire story of what God did to Abraham. And Hebrews gives us a gist. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. You know, you and me, we believe in Jesus. We have probably experienced the call of God in our lives, and we follow it. But how can we live a Christian life when we go through all kinds of tests. You know, what's interesting to see is Abraham had gone through a lot of tests in his life. First, God tested him to see, can you leave your security, your safety, and go to a place where I'll call you? He stumbles, he falters, but still he makes it. And then he asks him to go to this promised land and to stay there. And again, he stumbles, he falters, and still God sustains him. And over the years, he has grown in his walk. And here he is kind of towards 
the end of his life or at the prime of his life when he is old and God says his faith is tested. You know what this tells us? Our Christian life is going to be filled with tests. If you're thinking I'm a Christian now, I don't think I will have any more tests in my life. Everything should go smooth and easy. Something is probably wrong. So there are three things I want us to look today. Very simple questions that we always ask ourselves. And sometimes we know the answers to these questions, but still, I think it is good to hear what the Bible has to tell. First is, what is testing? Secondly, how do we overcome or succeed in testing? And thirdly, what does testing accomplish or why testing? You know, what is testing? You know, God is allowing tests in our life to really evaluate what we think we believe is true and how much. It is only when our faith is tested we know if we hold up enough. And I'm sure every single one of us who are here have gone through different tests at different periods of time in our lives. You know, for Abraham, finally it looked like his life was settled. You know, he moved from this country that he was familiar with, then he finally settled down. It's kind of like you move from your home country, you come to the United States, the land of opportunity, and you go through all the hurdles of, you know, getting your visas and getting a job and getting a house. And finally, when you settle down and breathe, you now want to have a peaceful life. And that's when God intervenes and says, Abraham, in, if we see in Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, he says, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Wow. Is God trying to kind of rub it in to Abraham? He says, Abraham, I know your life is going good. I know you're happy, but you know what? I know the one who gives you happiness is also your son. Can you take him and sacrifice him to me? If we back up a little bit in Abraham and Sarah's story, it's important to understand the background of this. For the first time in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham hears that his wife is going to give birth to a son when he is close to 100 years old. And you know what his default response was? He laughs. He laughs and says, what? At this age, I'm going to give a son? And you fast forward to Genesis chapter 18 in verses 12 to 15, when Sarah hears by the door Abraham receiving this message, she laughs, says, what? I'm as good as dead. How can I give birth to a son? And then when finally their son is born, he is named Isaac. And you know what the word Isaac means? We have a couple of Isaacs in our church. The word Isaac actually means he laughs. Because God was having the final laugh in a very joyful manner and says, you laughed? But here you go, I'm going to give you a son who was the object of your laughter, but he's also going to be the object of your joy. And you know, you don't see anything bad about Isaac's life or childhood. He was probably a very joyful child. And those of us who are parents, we know how much joy our children bring to us, right? When you come tired from work and you see your children's faces, they come running to you. It just refreshes you, right? There is nothing that can and beat that. I mean, I, we've recently become parents again, you know, the second time, and, and, and every time Brian and Sophia come running and giving a smile, especially after they do something wrong, you know, and Brian would do this, like blink his eyes, and you, you can't actually get upset at something like that, right? uh, and I've actually been told I have to attend the parenting class again because I'm kind of not doing the right job. But when a child like that, you get a child after 100 years of waiting, okay? This is not a joke. And God says he's going to be laughter, man. He's going to make your life happy. And you are enjoying and you are cherishing this beautiful thing in your life. And boom, God says, 
sacrifice it. That's intense. Isaac was not only a source of joy for Abraham and Sarah. We read in verse 17 and 18 of Hebrews, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He was also the object of hope, not just for Abraham and Sarah, because God promised them, through Isaac, I'm going to make you a father of many nations, and through a seed that is going to come through Isaac is how salvation is going to come for the entire world. So there is so much of expectations. You know, when your child is born, you have a dream for your child. You want to see your child grow up to become either a doctor or an engineer, like how it usually happens in many circles, or um, you want your child to be better than where you are. That's, that's a, every, any father's dream. And so here is a hope Abraham is having. Oh, my son is actually going to bless the nations, and boom, God is destroying that hope and says, I want you to sacrifice your son, your son whom you love. Now, Isaac had no other sons. His son, Ishmael, he was sent off, you know, what he tried. So he was the only son that was hope for him. So why? What is testing? You know what testing is? A testing that God allows is God takes what we love and set our hope on to test what we truly believe or have. God takes what we love and set our hope on to test truly what we believe. You can say all you want, oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I know if I die, I will go to heaven. Oh, I want to be a faithful Christian. But really, the test for our faith is not going to happen unless that thing which we have put our focus on, from which we are drawing our sense of joy, from which we are drawing our sense of hope, is going to be taken from us. Until that happens, you haven't passed the test of your Christian faith. It's easy to live a Christian life when that core thing is not touched. You can say, God, take everything except this. Don't mess with this, God. This is, you know, it's kind of special for me. It can be different for different people. For some of us, it can be your smartness, you know, at work or at school, unless that goes. You know, one project fails or you, your grades drop in one paper, and then how do you respond? For some of us, it could be our children that we have our sense of joy from, our hope from. Nothing hurts us more than something happening to our kids. We said, God, you do anything in my life, but don't touch my kids. We want our kids to grow up to be the most wonderful children, and we want sometimes for them to realize the dreams we couldn't, and we set our hope on them. Or sometimes for younger people, it's, it could be a pursuit of romance. Or for sometimes, for others, it could be health. It is something that we spend most of our time thinking about and that gives us actual pleasure. What is it that you think about in your life that gives you joy? What is it you're banking on for hope? Is it your own ability, your own skills, or your family, or your friends, or whatever it may be? Now, if God were to step in today and ask you, son, daughter, can you sacrifice that for me? How would you feel? Angry, hurt, upset? Why is God trying to take away what I love? That's the default response for most of us, isn't it? I remember when I lost my dad, that was my first response. It was anger. Why did God do that? And when I lost something else later on in my life that was dear to me, again, it was anger. Why do you do this, God? Because we feel we are entitled to have what we love that gives us joy, and no one should mess with it, including God. 
I'm entitled to this. Come on. There is this deep sense of self gratification that is connected to that and that can be a faith killer in our life and therefore God intervenes and says are you ready to sacrifice that what is testing that is testing and guess what we all are going to be tested if Abraham did not escape that testing none of us can escape that testing either you already have been or you will in that thing that we held dear to our hearts. Secondly, how do we overcome or succeed in testing? You know, the clue to that is in verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 11. He says, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. You know, the key word here is considered. You know, the Greek word for that is actually logizomai, from which comes logarithm. Now, many of you guys are software engineers. You love logarithms. I hated logarithms when I was in school because it's so painful. You had to memorize a ton of stuff. At least that's how we learned. But, but for some of you, you have to do that for your jobs. So what did Abraham do is it says he considered, I mean, he... He, his faith was not a blind faith, was not a blind leap faith. Oh, I'm just going to blindly trust in God and jump. I'm going to pass this test. Because we see Abraham immediately obeys. It says in Genesis 22, the next morning he picks up, he actually doesn't even go and have a chat with his wife. Hey, what do you think? You know, God's asking me to sacrifice the son. And I don't know what his wife would have told. You know, and, and isn't that what many of you guys do when you want to buy your favorite toys? Do you actually ask your wives before you buy it? You know what the response will be, right? And, and so you buy it and come and then you have that guilty face and then your wife asks what happened and you smile and that day you're very loving and nice and all that stuff. And then you realize you, you know, bought this thing. So Abraham probably knew that. I mean, he could ask his wife anything, but he knew if he asked her, can I take this daughter? She's not going to say yes. Which mom is going to say yes? But he wants to obey, you know. And he obeys. He wakes up. He picks up all the stuff, saddles his donkey, and sets on this journey for three days. Imagine the three days of mental trauma as a father he would go through. If God were to tell us today, can you sacrifice your son or your daughter? What would you go through in your mind? And so he walks with his son, and it's interesting. Isaac looks at Abraham and calls him Abba. You know, that's a very fond word of calling. It's when your children are really chilling with you and saying, Daddy, or whatever it is that may be in your language. Just hearing that word would have broken his heart. But he says he obeyed. Instantly he obeyed, and he went. You know, I like this quote by a Spanish philosopher. Spanish philosophers are great, very different from European philosophers and uh, American philosophers. You know, it's more for the heart and the mind together. Uh, Miguel de Unamo, Unamuno, he says, those who believe that they believe in God, but believe without passion, believe without anguish in their minds, believe without uncertainty, without doubt, without a hint of despair, even when they go through consolation, they believe only in the God idea, not God himself. They believe only in the God idea and not God himself. And many of us, I think, are guilty of that. We believe in the God idea. We believe in the salvation idea. We believe in the resurrection idea. We believe in the Christ idea. But do we believe with passion and in our heart of God, because Abraham did that. And that's what he was logizomizing with his mind. You know, what he did, his mind raced back in time to see what had God done. You know, God did not ask Abraham to kill his son. That would have been brutal. That would have made God a barbaric God. And that would be something that is very detestable to any human being. He tells him, 
offer your son as a sacrifice. Now, there is a big difference between that. You know, when Abraham heard the word, offer your firstborn son, where do you think his mind would have gone to, knowing what has God done so far? It would have gone all the way back to the Bible, to Cain and Abel, seeing that first sacrifice. And, and, and later on, he, you know, we know what God does. What, why is it that God demands a sacrifice? He realized, even from the Garden of Eden, a sacrifice meant that God is upset with us for what we ought to do and what we fail to do. Because he's a God of justice. He realized that God is a God of justice. He realizes immediately his shortcomings. He realizes immediately how he has messed up. And God is actually right to take anything from us. And he would do later on with the Israelites when they are in Egypt. When the Pharaoh sins, God says the firstborn is going to die. Then he sends the plague. And so the firstborn in every household was killed because of their heights of sinfulness. Abraham knew that. He knew there is a justice of God, so I need to obey. But he also knew there is the grace of God. Because there was a lamb that was there that was slaughtered. Even in the Garden of Eden, God did not kill Adam and Eve, but they slaughtered an animal and clothed him with the skin of that animal. And he was going to do the same when it came to the Israelites. And so in Abraham's mind, he understood, oh, the justice of God demands that I just do what I need to because I know I have messed up. But also the grace of God I know is going to save and take care of the situation. Although I don't understand it, yet it would have been a wrestling experience for him. But he says he believed that God would raise him up. Resurrection was not taught. You know what really helped Abraham overcome his success? It was this deep, passionate, experiential faith in who God is and what he has done that helped him to pass the test. Do you know God in this way in your life? Are you okay with the justice of God? Because if you are okay with the justice of God, you will never get angry when God commands these tests in our life. Have we tasted the grace and mercy of God? Because if we have tasted the grace and mercy of God, that will inspire us to offer anything to him, knowing that we are giving ourselves to a gracious God. And thirdly, what does this testing accomplish? Why does God have all these tests in our life? Does God want to test our faith? He, does, he wants to know how we measure up. Isn't he an omniscient, all-knowing God? Doesn't he not know how feeble our faith is? You know, one of the reasons that God tests our faith is not for him to see how much faith we have. It is for us to see how much faith we have. It is for us to know where we have our faith on. How much faith do we have on what in our life is what these tests will reveal to us. When life goes smooth, everything goes smooth, we are blind to what are we actually believing on. But when the crisis comes, when you see, oh, a layoff, a layoff is looming around the corner, when you see an uncertainty is going to come around the corner, when you see that the children you love are going to leave your house and you're suddenly going to be left with this stranger whom you spent several years and you have actually not grown in loving and thinking how you are going to spend the rest of your life with, that's when all these questions will surface. Where is your faith? What have you been believing on so far? And how much of that faith is actually on Christ? If we have that faith, it emboldens us. If we do not have that faith, if our faith has been spread wide and thin in so many other things, then these tests recalibrates and brings us back to Christ. You know, the people to whom this was written, the Hebrews, they needed it. They were going to be thrown to lions. They were going to be beheaded. They were going to be left homeless because the persecution was looming out. And they needed to know 
that this was just going to be a testing of their faith. They would needed to know that they can come through stronger after this. They needed to know that even if everything was taken from their lives, this Jesus is greater than everything for them. So that they cannot leave their faith. And what does tests do? It helps us to come back to Christ. It helps us to look, where are we drawing our sense of joy from? Where are we drawing our sense of hope from? And helps us to withdraw from that and fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ alone. You know, giving up the firstborn child always meant an act of sacrifice for sins to please God's justice and receive his grace. You know, just as we are reminded of this, we now come to the anti-type of Isaac who was Jesus Christ himself. What do you love the most in your life right now? On what have you set your hope for your life mostly right now? Money, power, positions, relationships, success, whatever it may be, it's going to be tested. You know, um, I remember my sister giving birth to her first child several years ago. His name was Joshua. He was the joy of our family because after going through a lot of difficult times, he was the first child who entered our family. And he was this cute little baby with his innocent smiles and, and terrific looks. Until in six months, we found out one suddenly, one day that uh, his head started swelling. And we thought it could be one of these fevers that were going around and rushed him to a local doctor. And the doctor said, he watched it and he said, well, this doesn't look like a fever and I want you guys to go to a bigger hospital. And we took him there and they scanned. And to our utter shock, we were told he had brain tumor and this was growing super fast. And the doctors said he has hours, if not days, to live and we need to operate him out. And his, the tumor was growing, so there was pressure building on his brain. And they had to decide in a few hours of doing an open skull surgery so they can take a sample and it had to be sent to Bangalore so it could be tested for what type of cancer it was. Just the thought that a six-month-old baby's skull is going to be opened up was unbearable pain for us. And then they did, and I remember taking that and testing it and coming back, and they found that it was a cancer and it's growing super fast. But even as he was fighting the cancer, you know, the pressure was so much on his brain, so they had to actually pierce needles into his head to drain the fluid so that he doesn't experience pain. And so I was made to sit one night in the intensive care unit next to baby Joshua, this baby whom I had played right from day one, cherished holding in my hands, and I was given the most difficult task of holding his hands so that he doesn't pluck out these needles that are pierced in his skull. And I, I remember sitting right next to the child, seeing this baby suffer and asking why. Why should this beautiful six-month-old baby go through this much pain? And if it pained me to watch this child, imagine how much more pain and agony it would have caused for God to watch his own son on the cross. And in a few days, he passed away. Until today, the most painful experience in my life has been this, of going to the mortuary and receiving baby Joshua from the cold freezer. There's nothing more gut-wrenching than holding a dead six-month-old cold baby in your hands. It just brings your heart out. And, and you, you saw that, and 
My sister, my, my brother-in-law could not even see my sister because it was too hard. And, and I remember going up to my sister after that and, and how she wept and cried. And it tested something deep within us, but it also showed me if at a human level it pains us to see this child, how much more would it have pained God when he took his son Jesus and just like how Abraham put wood on Isaac's own head and made him carry it, Jesus put the wooden cross, God put the wooden cross on Jesus and made him carry up the mountain. But unlike in the case of Abraham where God said, stop, do not kill this child. In this case, Jesus, God did not stop on Jesus and unleash this full fury and wrath upon him. And it is interesting that the place of Calvary is located in the same place of mountains where Isaac was sacrificed. The same mountain ranges where Mount Moriah was is where Calvary is. And Abraham said he saw Jesus far away and he saw this Jesus, not his son Isaac who was spared, but because for sparing his son Isaac, another son had to be sacrificed on the cross. And we had to go through that because of your sin and my sin. And now when I look at that Jesus, who sacrificed much, much more than baby Joshua did, not for his fault, but for my fault. Now I have a strange love for this Jesus. This love that ought to trump all other loves in my life. This love that ought to trump all other things I set my hope upon in my life. And that's what Abraham got. And he told Isaac, the Lord provides. And he built an altar and sacrificed another animal and called that place in Mount Moriah, he gave a name for God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. You're seeking for joy, you're looking at it in the wrong places. The real joy is found in Christ Jesus, he provides. You're seeking for hope, you're looking at it in your jobs, in your positions, in planning out your future, your retirement, in all of those things, but no, it's, it's found in Christ Jesus. That is what Jehovah Jireh means. It saddens me today sometimes when people use the term Jehovah Jireh for exactly the opposite things, to give them all these other things in life where they still want to put their hope and their love and draw their joy from and say, oh, Jehovah Jireh, he meets all these needs, making him so petty, so small, but he is so huge. And because God did not withhold his own son, and let him die for you and me, we can let go of these things. It's actually very freeing, you know. When we are trying to seek our sense of pleasure through what either others think of us or through our jobs, through our security or all this, we're actually enslaved to that. You end up constantly thinking what others are thinking about you. You end up constantly thinking how can the future be safe. You end up constantly thinking about, oh, I hope my children don't mess up. But once you are free from that, and know that your joy is going to come from Christ, life is different. You actually can live a happy life because others do not control. You cannot control what others think about you, can you? But you can control how that affects you or not. You cannot control how your children are going to end up when they grow up. You cannot control how safe your investments are. Have I saved enough to retire well? cannot control all of that. You do not know what inflation is. You do not know how life is. You do not know how healthy you will be and how much money you would need to stay healthy. You cannot control, oh, how, is this job enough to make me safe and my family safe financially? No. But the moment you realize, I'm going to go and look at Christ alone, you're freed. You don't have to fear what others think about you. You don't have to fear your boss because you may lose your job, because he is not your security. Christ is our security and our provider. And he is Jehovah Jireh. If he gave Christ to us, will he not do anything? Because on the cross, the psalmist says, grace and mercy kissed each other. Justice and grace kissed each other on the cross for your sake and my sake, so that we are fully loved in Christ, 
ease our joy, ease our hope for this life and the next one so we can let go of these things, however precious they are to us and see how freeing it is. And once we are able to go through this crisis and come out is when our faith is encouraged. And that is why Jesus says, if you love me, if you are able to connect with me, because I have taken your cross, now you can deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. That is what it means. What is picking up our cross, denying ourselves and following Jesus means? It simply means leaving those things from which we were drawing our sense of joy and hope from and trusting in Jesus and following him. That's the cost of discipleship. We cannot do it unless Jesus is greater than the idols of our lives, which our tests will reveal to us. And once you are able to go through this crisis and come out strong, you're going to praise God for that. You're going to stand stronger. And that's why the word says, consider it pure joy, brothers, when you go through testing of various kinds, because testing produces faith, faith, patience, patience, character. Testing recalibrates our faith in Christ from our faith in our idols. By removing things we have falsely set our hope and joy upon to trust in Christ alone. Are we ready to pick up our cross and follow Jesus? Is Jesus greater than the idols of our lives, our hearts? Then let's run to this Jesus and embrace him. Let's pray.